I basically brought a Creative Records down to the studio. I played something for Beck off a of Boney M record. I grabbed a little loop of that, like a little bit of that. It's kind of a little drum thing. Looped it up, and then we just started building on that. That's seven-time Grammy-nominated producer and mixer Tony Hoffer. Tony's discography is full of records that have likely been sonic and musical influences for so many of us. We're talking about stuff like Phoenix Alphabetical, M83 Hurry Up We're Dreaming, Kooks Inside In, Inside Out, and Beck Midnight Vultures. As somebody that works with bands live in the studio, Tony knows how to keep momentum going. And then so I'm I'm pushing everybody, I'm pushing myself, I'm pushing the, just the whole team, the artists, everyone. So just like, let's keep moving, let's keep the momentum. And I think by having that target. Tony tells us how he's always on the artist side and always working to bring their vision to life. And I'm asking myself, well, what is the sonic identity of this thing we're doing? If you can answer that, then we're not there. And part of facilitating that vision is giving every idea a chance and exploring every option. The only way to do that. If there's certain sounds that you like, you need, you need to know how to either create them quickly or find where they are. If you've saved them or if it's a preset or whatever it is, you just need to know how to get to stuff quickly. So this one's a masterclass in everything from production to distortion. So stick around for my interview with Tony Hoffer. I was listening to a lot of your catalog this morning, kind of revisiting, you know, a lot of records that I listen to so much. So I know you've had a huge influence on so many producers and musicians out there. But I'm curious to know, is there a project or an album that you did that you think shaped you the most or helped you get on the path that you, you know, are on now? A project that I did, I would say probably would have been Beck Midnight Vultures. Because, you know, that that was sort of the first big milestone for me you know the first the first time i'd worked with a well-known artist and the first project that like came out on a major label and you know i knew people would be some people would hopefully hear the the record but i would say that project in particular that album in particular was kind of a catalyst for how i ended up doing a lot of things even to this day just in terms of production um what takes to choose, how far to go in terms of getting things um, precise or not precise or leaving things a little loose, whatever, you know, that that established a lot of things for me. Um, yeah, it was, it was amazing working with Beck and, and, and everybody that was around, all the musicians at that time. So yeah, I would say probably that album, but, but I mean, the reality is, I mean, they're, they're all, I mean, even I've been doing this for a number of years now, but even records that I'm currently doing, I'm still finding new ways of doing things. You're yeah. still as a producer and as a mixer and engineer, you're still, the hunt is always on to find the, you know, a new way of, of presenting a synth or a guitar tone or or whatever, you know, just to kind of bring something new to the to the space. But um, so I'm, I'm always finding inspiration with with pretty much every project that I do, because the reality is, like, whatever I did on the last project that I did, it's guaranteed not to work on <laughs> this next project. For totally. And so you're you know you're constantly having to find new things. But but yeah, but a, a lot of the the framework I would have I'd say would have come from from that first big project that i did with Beck. yeah that that record i was just listening to that one the most this morning because i i haven't listened to it in a while and i was going to ask you about it later the way the mix is and the way you guys put it together is so cool like the you know that first track is like so mono but the things that are on the sides like really catch you i just think there's a lot of like really deliberate choices that are really dope was that something that you guys were talking about where you're making that record like hey we're gonna do this let's let's fucking go for it like, let's, you know, leave safe on the edge and make what we think is cool. It was definitely, let's make something that we think is cool. Yeah. You know, and we, you know, we wanted to make something, the, the spirit of that project was, you know, let's, we're going to go on a, an adventure of making something that hasn't been made before. And and I think for, for, for Beck, I mean, I think pretty much all of his albums are, are that really. Yeah. But this one in particular, we were going pretty deep because we weren't working in a traditional studio. We were, we worked in, we we're working in a studio in, in Beck's house. So, so we had a lot of freedom and a lot of time, maybe too much time actually, <laughs> but it, it definitely allowed us to experiment and try different iterations of songs and, um, 
you know, it, it allowed us to be very creative and to to make mistakes and try things. Some things would work, some things not. But you know, it was, it was good. When you say you you got you set out because I you know I hear people say stuff like this all the time. You set out to make something that hadn't been made before. Well, like what's what's a conversation like that with an artist when you you're about to go into pre-production and everybody wants to just kind of change the game. Like how, how do you even approach that? It feels so daunting just to say, we're going to do this. It's, it's hard to, to, to say we're going to make something that's never been made before. And this is how we're going to do it. Right. You kind of have to just start throwing things at the wall, which is, which is pretty much what we did. You know, how I started with that project, I, I, just, I basically brought a crate of records down to the studio and then we just, I played something for Beck um off a of bony m record and it sounded cool we so I, I grabbed a little loop of that like a little bit of that it's kind of a little drum thing looped it up and then we just started building on that and i think just by nature of the choices that we made not trying to do things that that we've heard before i think that that was the the, the true north was that like let's just make something we haven't heard before so when it came time to doing a guitar part or whatever let's find a tone that we haven't really heard before yeah yeah or or something that's played in a way an approach that we haven't heard before with this type of tone yeah with just suppose with this type of rhythm drum beat you know and loop or whatever so so i think it was it was um it was kind of a, a bit by bit sort of record and um, you know, one thing at a time and whatever the last thing was that we put on there, we knew that we wanted to do something else that would keep it veering in these different directions. And, and then hopefully we would end up in the destination that was the right place to be. Yeah, totally. Well, it, it's interesting because this, this opening little bit kind of segues so many of the, the questions that I had. Let's go Sonic Identity for a minute. Like, I think, you know, people that are familiar with your work can probably pick out a record that you did out of a lineup like you you kind of have a thing is is that kind of from this commitment of just doing what you like or do you think it's like shaped over time where you're where you kind of have grabbed things that work and don't work and cataloged them all the, the sonic identity is is for me is like such an important thing yeah that i'm just always trying to find what you know and i'm asking myself well what is the sonic identity of this thing we're doing what is it yeah. And if it's if I can't answer that, then we're not there. You know, we've got to keep going. And I think a lot of that, you know, growing up, I listened to a lot of music and I still do and have a real good knowledge of of music. I, maybe I could be a music historian for you know for certain things. I'm I'm <laughs> quite knowledgeable. But that's been it's been really help helpful for me over the years to be able to um just have this catalog in my head of different reverbs that were cool in different instances of songs that I liked or, yeah. you know, and, and, uh, somehow this, a certain song evoked a certain f feeling or an energy or an atmosphere or whatever. And, um, that could be cool on this song to, to give it some kind of a, a new, a twist or a new thing. I feel like I have a lot of those, a lot of tools, um, buried in, in my head just from the, the years as a, as a kid, as a teenager, as a young adult, as an adult, growing up, whatever, listening to all kinds of music and and having a good understanding of how it was made and created. So, yeah, I hope I hope that answers. Yeah, the no, question. It, it, to it totally does. Do you, do you ever? Some people do this, and some people don't. I sit down with the artist, like you know, mid session, and and just play them something, see how they how they react. Like, hey, what what do you think of this? You know, this thing from the seventies that I, I love. Do you you know pull anything out of this you want to put in here? Yeah, yeah, for sure. Yeah, no, I'll, I'll reference things all the time because sometimes it's it's hard to 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 say. Well, I'd like to do this. It's going to be kind of this meets that, and it's it's very hard. It seems very arbitrary, and maybe it doesn't even make it. It probably doesn't make sense because it probably hasn't been done before. So it's the uh, so it's better to say. Well, there's two things. One way would be to show the references. It'd be kind of like this: the chorus of this the way the reverb or whatever it is yeah. with the snare of that. Um, or if we can work fast, you know, I try to work fast. So let's just do it quickly. And then you'll, see, then we can talk about it, um, which is probably the best way, but, but yeah, 
I, it, it can be so hard the way that everybody describes music. You know, it's like what you say and what the you know lead singer of the band translates that as could be you know totally totally unrelated. That's why, yeah, being able to do it quick is probably definitely the way to go. Um, yeah, yeah, preferable for sure. Yeah, because then you can see like okay, it's it works or it doesn't work. Do you do you feel like it, when you when kind of getting into production already? Uh, do you do you feel like every idea should get chased in the studio? Like is every you know, if the bass player has an idea and it's doable quick, does everybody get a shot to kind of try something? I mean, I, I try to do that, especially if they're good ideas. And, and a lot of times, I mean, obviously I'm, I'm coming with a lot of ideas, but I, I definitely do want the artists to have, you know, input and to, to bring their ideas. Cause often a lot of their ideas are really good. Yeah. And, and even the, the wackier ones have many times been, amazing yeah so i definitely welcome ideas from everyone you know everyone in with you that's part of the the group that i'm working with and whether we get to all of them you know there might be some where you can kind of tell like a it's probably not the right thing you know it's probably not the right thing and it probably would take a long time to try and so, you know, you'll have to kind of whittle them down to the best. And, and we'd have a discussion of, on the consensus of like what everyone thinks. Like, all right, what, you know, we've got three ideas, A, B, and C. We can do one. What's everyone feeling? And all right, everyone's feeling B. So that's what we're going to spend the next couple hours doing then, focusing on B. Yeah. What I wanted to talk about mostly or a fair bit with you is producing bands. We're basically there, right? Um, a, what's your approach to kind of, taking like a really great live band that everybody loves and then translating that into a record that is a new experience or a different experience for the listener. I mean, obviously the record is going to be more produced, but like, how do you make sure that you retain what everybody loved when they signed that band or what, why everybody went to the show and you put that into a record? Yeah. So when I'm working with an artist, I'm always looking for the strengths. And so if that, if, if that's one of the strengths, the live show, let's say, um, and clearly everyone's liking the live show, then I would definitely factor that into how I'm doing things in the studio. So that may determine whether we use a click or not. Like if they're not using a click live yeah, or if they are using a click live, like whatever's happening, I, I would assess what's happening live. I would try to get a good understanding of what's happening live. I would try to see them in person yeah if, if if i was if i'm if they were on tour if it's possible to do that sometimes it's not because they're not playing but at the very least i would do some kind of rehearsal with them in a rehearsal room and i would be there right in front of them watching them live but but yeah i would try to distill down like what is the thing that makes this so great and i would definitely try to keep all of those great points in by the time we get to the studio so that if that is a thing and, it's, and if it's a big strength where there's sort of, I don't know, a, a cool attitude or the, the songs have a bit more of an, a, an edge or um, there's sort of a freeness to the songs that maybe they wouldn't have if they're chained to a click or things are too clean in the studio or, or whatever. I'd be very mindful of that to make sure that that doesn't happen where we things are boring they're not too clean or they're they're too clean and then it, and then it's a big surprise for everybody so i wouldn't want that to happen yeah do you ever find that that when you kind of you identify what you think that special piece of an artist is do you find that generally the artist is unaware of that i feel like some people are like when they're doing their own thing they're unaware of like what is actually connecting with you know people with the audience do you, do you find that to be the case yeah i would say most of the time, but you know, and then there's sometimes there's artists that I work with that definitely have, they're very intuitive as to what they're tapped in people. Yeah. People want, need and want from them, um, as an artist, but yeah. Do you think that helps or hurts? Is it just, or it's just a feature? It's no, it's, it's not good if you do that. It's not bad if you do, you know what I mean? Does it matter whether you're in touch with that? I don't know if it matters. I mean, in on one hand, if I were an artist, 
I suppose it'd probably be, I suppose it'd be helpful if you really were dialed in with your fans. It probably would be a good thing, I would say. <laughs> you know, because then you would know. But, you know, but then at the same time, it's, you know, you have to make the music, you, you have to be evolving. Yeah. So you can't be thinking, oh, well, what, my fans aren't going to like this, because then I feel like that'd be a little restrictive. But I, I think just having a good understanding of what your fans want and, you know, as long as it's not limiting what, what you do. Yeah. 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 Managing. I, I like to talk about managing expectations and how like you can use expectations to fulfill somebody or totally blow their mind when they're like, they expect this and you're like, nope, that's not what we're doing today. Uh, I think that's a pretty powerful tool when it comes to mixing or producing or anything. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, so along the lines of, you know, managing expectations, how do you handle, because we, we both know making a record can take weeks and weeks and weeks, personalities in the room, momentum slowdowns, you know, maybe creativity slumps on week four. Like, what are some of the things that you do during a month-long session that kind of just keeps the band excited, fresh, moving forward? Well, I, I, I definitely, I have targets every day. Um, and, I, and I usually figure those targets out there'll be kind of an overall target where I need to get this done by X date. Yeah. You know? Then there'll be daily targets where the target is to get the majority of this song tracked music, the, the, the music part of it tracked, maybe even get a vocal if possible. So by having that target, and that's usually, that's a target that I'll set in a way for myself. Mm. So I may or may not discuss that target with the artist, but it causes me to push to where we stay on target to get what we need to get done yeah. by 10 o'clock or whatever, you know, by the end of the day, usually we, we hit the target or, or go beyond it. You know, we'll, we'll get, a, we'll get the, ma the majority of the song done, if not the whole song and get it in a good place where then we can hear it the next morning and have a good some good perspective to have a fresh listen and then we can do some additional bits to it and then get on to another one and you know keep going and i think by by doing that by having clear targets and 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 usually i'll establish maybe the night before or the morning of you know i might mention something like hey i'd like to dig into this song song x i'd yeah. like to dig into that and um get deep pretty deep with it the morning before you know, I'll wake up, have breakfast, I'll be listening to things. I'll make some sort of decision like, okay, I feel like we can get everything, all instruments up to blah, 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 done. And then that'll be my target. And then so I'm I'm pushing everybody, I'm pushing myself, I'm pushing the, just the whole team, the artists, everyone to, to just like, let's keep moving, let's keep the momentum. And I think by having that target, it causes us to not have um, slumps. Yeah. And and get too fixated on minutia that is is really insignificant to the target. Some things we can come back to, you know? Yeah. There's some things where I feel like we're getting bogged down. We could, and, and it's possible to come back to it like later on, almost just like, let's just step out of that, focus our attention on something else. Yeah. And then get back moving, you know? Um, and then we can revisit that later in the day or the next day, and it'd be a much quicker cycle to do that. You know, very cool. Is um, so? Is that a good, uh, like, a pretty average pace for you, a song ish a day, for when you're working? I guess it depends on the artist, but yeah, it depends on the artist. But yeah, I would say yeah, song a day for you know for for like the main stuff. Yeah, and then usually the the kind of fun tweaky stuff. The overdub stuff that could take a half day, and it, you know, again, like it depends on what we're talking about here, like the the type of music we're doing, the artist. Um, can the artist work at a pace like that? Some can, some some not, and that's fine too. Yeah. Um, sometimes um, for the more electronic leaning projects that I do, sometimes the um, a song a day is not realistic because there's so much sound design and just building kind of the the, just the sonic world of the thing and it so it takes a, a bit longer yeah but um but if it's if it's if it's a band 
and um, everyone's focused. Yeah, we can get a lot done in a day. That's awesome. I, I, you know, a lot of people like they'll start a record and they'll do drums this week. We're this week we're doing drums, but I, I feel like the way that you're talking, the going the song by song approach. I feel like that probably allows each song to be the character of that song. Is it is that part of the reason you do it? So that like, hey, the drums have to be like this for this song. Because I feel like if you just did drums to a couple demo guitars and some clicks and stuff like that, you might have a cohesiveness that is wrong. You know what I mean? Yeah, I, I don't. I don't like. Uh, I've I've done that before because I've had to. You know, where we were, we were for whatever reason we were in situations where we had to hire a. Um, bring in a session drummer and we only had this person for two days. So I, uh, I don't love that, yeah. but 99% of, of what I do. Yeah. I'm doing it song by song so I can set everything up to be based around that song, you know, and it's, it's custom for that song. I don't like doing a week of drums and then a week of bass and then a week of what, you know, then guitars for two weeks and synths for a week, whatever. I don't, that doesn't really, I, li I like doing it song by song. I like getting vocals done sooner than later. You know, the vocals are obviously a very important piece of the puzzle. Yeah. So I like getting vocals done on the earlier side of, of the whole, of whatever time we have, just so I know we've got some extra time in case we need to go back and, you know, do do another pass at something or drop in on some bits, maybe some lyrics change after living with it. I, you know, I don't know, but, but I like having a little bit of time. I don't like saving vocals to the very end. Yeah. Well, it keeps everybody engaged too. It's like, if you're just doing drums yeah. for a week, like, you know, the bass player is like just not coming in for a yeah, week yeah. and then he's going to have a problem with some fill. <laughs> you know? yeah. So, uh, you, you mentioned sound design and, and, you know, elect electronic records taking a little bit longer. Do you have any tips for producers on like just knowing your sample library, knowing your record collection, how you organize things, anything to help like a young kid just work faster when he's shaping tones? Yeah, I mean, that's to, to work fast. You definitely need to know your tools. Yeah. And you've got to put the time in. I, you know, I've put a lot of time in on my own before before I had my you know, before I started doing bigger, big projects that people know about, I spent years of doing lots of unknown stuff and my own stuff. And with that, learning my favorite samples or um, being able to work fast with the computer or be able to mic something quickly and, or if something's wrong with the sound of it, I know how to adjust the mic quickly. I know, I just know what to do and I can just do it, be A to B, get back and, and keep things moving. So yeah, you, you just have to know your, your, your tools and know where, where if it's, if it's like you mentioned electronic, uh, artists or, you know, producer, yeah, you definitely need to know what synths or what, what, um, if, if there's certain sounds that you like, you need, you need to know how to either create them quickly or, find where they are if you've saved them or if it's a preset or whatever it is you just need to know how to get to stuff quickly yeah as a and i don't know if you know damien taylor producer mixer if you guys have i met, don't think so no he uh he always encourages people to go through their sample library and delete the stuff you don't like and that was like mind-blowing to me because you're like you know i've got 80 gigs of drums and you use the same four kicks and he's like why do you have <laughs> seven thousand kicks when you use 50 of them just delete them <laughs> i was like but i can't delete them they're 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 my samples that I don't use. You know what I mean? <laughs> yeah. I, that'd be for me. I, I use, yeah. I mean, I have 80, I don't know. I don't know how many, what I've got, but I've got a lot that I've accumulated over the years. I feel like, I don't think I could do that because I work on so many different types of things where, and I'm mixing so many different styles and genres that I, I, I know where everything is for the most part. I can move fast, you know, Yeah. but there are some things where I've only used once or twice over 24 years, but I still, I'm holding that in there just in case something comes up a, a couple of years from now and I need that thing. Yeah. And you know, it'll be there. And I, I still, I don't know if I could, if I could do that. Before I deleted them, I definitely backed them up. So they're all on another hard drive. Yeah, there you go. <laughs> but uh, at, at the end of a session, you know, 
you talk about doing so many, like making new sounds and, you know, creating things that haven't been heard before. At the end of a project, do you do any like saving Pro Tools track presets or saving presets or grabbing drum samples? Do you do any like archival, like, ah, these are dope. I want to save these and, and know I can get back to them? No, I, I never have. I mean, yeah, it's just like on to the next thing. I mean, it's, um, I'm just, I just don't want, like what I, like what I said earlier, I, I just feel like whatever I did on this project that I'm j just finished, I don't feel that that is going to work on the next project that I have. Yeah. And, and I like having things be specific to each project. Yeah. Um, now there might be certain ways and techniques, certain, you know, certain things that I do from project to project that, that are the same, like the way things are mic'd or, or organized or, or whatever. But in terms of sounds, I try to create the sonic identity for each project, like have that be unique, a unique thing and, um, not, not get into assembly line cookie cutter type stuff. I'm, I'm not a fan of presets. Yeah. So, yeah. Do you, do you think, well, I mean, obviously you're going to think this because you're not a fan of presets because when you came up, you were using analog synths and you were building sounds. Do you think the fact that like now you can download Arturia and just load up every Juno preset you can think of, do you think kids should not use the presets and learn how to make a Juno sound? I think they should learn how to make a Juno sound so you can get the sound that's right for your the thing that you're trying to do and just have a, a good understanding of how that instrument works, you know? Yeah. To be very causative over that and not just flipping, be flipping through presets. Now, with that said, sometimes there's some cool presets, you know? Sometimes I'll flip through presets and I'll find something that's actually perfect. It's maybe a very complex sound that would have taken me a while to program yeah. on something, like some soft synth or whatever. But for the most part, I'm really just trying to find something unique for each part or each project or so if I did find a preset that I used, I probably wouldn't use it for straight up something else. Yeah. 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 Sometimes I feel like it's like this, you know, all the technology that we have today is like so enabling for, you know, young producers to like learn music and like be making something cool. But then at the same time, it also enables you to skip some of that learning that you and I have gone through, maybe this is just me almost being 40. Maybe this is why I feel this way. <laughs> but uh, I just feel like you can kind of skip some of these basic understanding of, you know, how to build these things and you can get away with it, but you can still be successful. So I don't know if it's a good thing or a bad thing. I don't know. Do you have an opinion? It's whatever it works. If it, if, if, if it makes someone a better, if may, if it causes them to make better music, then cool. You know, then whatever. There's, there's so many ways of doing any one thing. There's so many ways of getting a cool synth sound. You can do it by scratch and, you know, reset everything and dial it in your way. Yeah. It's cool for some people, other people, they'll find a preset and they're very good at that. And they're good at matching that preset with the part, with the song. And it's, and it's great and it's cool. And I've worked with many artists that they use that that's how they work. And, and it's great. So yeah, it's just for me, I'm, if, if you, if we were in a room together and it's like, okay, let's get a synth sound. I'll probably just walk over to the synth and just start dialing something in. For me, that's quicker than to just be flipping through the presets. You know, I don't know. That's just me. Do you have any weird tips? Like the most unorthodox shit that you did on accident or you thought wouldn't work that has become like, well, I guess you, you're always changing things, but is there anything super weird that you can share with people that you like? Super weird um, tricks. Super weird. Um, I mean, I love a lot of late 80s and early 90s digital multi-effects processors. Mm -hmm. I, I feel like they're um, they're so shitty that they're they're really good. Yeah. <laughs> uh, they have a, an interesting uh, profile. You know, they they um, they're just different than nicer, let's say it's a reverb or whatever, you know, they're, they're just different than a nicer reverb. And they're definitely different than a plug-in reverb. It's just a different thing. So there's, you know, there's a few that I, that I really love, um, that, that, and I use quite a bit and they're cheap, you know, nice. um, 
But what else? I use lots of pedals for various things. You know, I'll record a bunch of stuff and I'll use pedals. Yeah. I'm doing that. But then I'll also run things through pedals to go even further. Cool. And have a bit more control. Like, you know, once it's been recorded, I can I can be more aggressive with with what I'm doing. But yeah, there's there's some really uh there's there's a there's a, a bunch of kind of junky pedals that I love that are they're, they're just cheap junky pedals that just do something cool. You know, there's there's certain gear and I learned this early on when I was when I was an intern at a studio years ago. But there, I would basically run drums or whatever through outboard gear, and I would distort the input of of the gear. And um, so there's there's certain gear that I just like analog and digital. I just like how it distorts. Yeah. And I'll use that for um, for certain things. And it's just it's different than distorting with decapitator or some plugin, some 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 um distortion plugin it's a very just a different thing oh i was going to ask you about distortion and saturation actually because uh when i think of a lot of the records that you know i've listened to that you've made your distortion and saturation stuff is so good it's like it's not brittle and harsh the way it can be do you is that anything you're doing after the fact can you elaborate on that or is it really just understanding what distorts how and then choosing the right thing for the right thing Oh, well, thank you. I'm glad you noticed because I, I put a lot of thought into the 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 the, the grit basically. Yeah. Um, it's it's done if it's something that I'm producing. Yeah, it's it's there's there's um, grit. I call it grit versus distortion because when I think of distortion, it's that's I, I think of more of like a saturated mm. sound, and I don't necessarily want that. Yeah, I don't want it to be. Um, distorted distorted i want it or you know oversaturated and that that sort of thing that that wouldn't be quite right i yeah. wanted to have a grit to it kind of like some an early stones record or you know where or, or you know so like the the early motown records where things are kind of they're breaking but it's very satisfying yeah yeah so yeah a lot of that if if it's something that i'm producing then yeah we're 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 Go, we're, we're getting that. We're trying to get that however we can. So again, it's by overloading a preamp that's that um, that it's where it's enough to where it's it's kind of breaking up or it's it's adding a little bit of hair to yeah. the thing to the to the sound. And then I may go even further. And then when I go to mix it, I might go even further with additional um, grit. Yeah. And it's usually not a, a lot that I'm adding. It's just I'm adding little bits on a lot of things, and so it adds up in a certain way. Um, and I and I don't like to use the same grit on everything. I think that's also important. Yeah, because they, they all have different colors. You know, some are going to emphasize the low end. Some are going to be better on the mid. Some are so are better on the top. So just not using like the same plugin let's if it's a plugin not using that same thing on everything and if it's if it's outboard not using that same pedal or piece of gear for each time i'm trying to overload something yeah yeah when you you know you definitely understand the character of these things when you were you probably don't do this now but years ago if time allowed did you do a lot of comparison when you were mixing like what's this sound like compared to that okay i like the way that this pushes the low mids, this isn't working here, or have you just accumulated it over the the decades of making records? How do you mean compare comparison to to what? I guess taking a second to shoot out, like before choosing to. We'll use plugins for example because it's easier. So before just throwing decapitator on, did you ever try retro color next to decapitator next to Saturn and be like, okay, Saturn is what I want to use because of this? Yeah, yeah, for sure. I mean, yeah, in the when we were you know before. The plugins, yeah, we we would shoot things out, yeah, uh, just to see. You know, we try maybe between one and three options. You know, we would know that there's one of these will be cool. They might even all be a little similar, but there's going to be something that's going to pop out of the speakers. Yeah, it'll tell us. You know, so yeah, we would definitely shoot it out, and I still do that if I'm mixing something. Let's say uh, maybe something that I didn't produce, something that someone else produced, but they sent to me uh, to mix. 
and I'm trying to get that grit, which maybe they didn't, they didn't do that when they were capturing everything. I'm trying to find different ways to, to creep that grit in there to, to not have things sound too clean. And, and yeah, so I'll try different ways of doing that because so, sometimes the plugin, decapitator, whatever it is, um, Saturn's great, you know, whatever it is, it may be great on that last project, but it's not working the same way on the same instrument for this next project. Yeah. I don't know why that is, but it is what it is. <laughs> so yeah, you gotta, sometimes you have to just do a quick check just to make sure. Yeah. Um, you can't just blindly do the thing like, well, I always do this on my drums, you know? Um, there are things that I do use a lot for, for drums or bass or whatever, but I am checking and I may not use the, the thing that I always use. There, there, there are occasions where it's not right. And so I swap out for something else and you know, but yeah, you have to constantly check that. Yeah. Um, a hard tangent here before we close, I was meant to ask you this earlier. I feel like you've made a lot of records that are both commercially successful and, you know, highly respected by musicians and music community, which we both know is, is not always easy to do. What happens when you're straddling that line of what the artist wants, staying true to that versus bringing in some of what the label might expect or some of what the radio is looking for? Do you have to like live in that world at all? Or do you just make a record and it resonates and it works? I mean, I'm always on the artist side. Whoops. I'm always on the artist side. Um, and I feel like that's the place to be. Yeah. You know, helping them create the vision they have for the songs, me coming in and amplifying that vision. You know, that, that's, that's, that's what I like to do. Sometimes, yes, you know, labels, if it's a, if they're signed to a label, then yeah, there, it's possible the label will have some, some input on that. For the most part, the majority of the projects that I've worked on, everyone has been on the same page. It's been very rare. I'd have to like really think back as to a time where the artist is doing one thing and the label is talking about some other thing. Yeah. And there's usually a parody. The label signed them for a reason. So there's some, yeah, they, they have an understanding. Now, sometimes when you get into the, the third or fourth or sixth or seventh album, there can be a thing where now there's some expectations. The label is expecting a single or a certain thing of a certain way. Yes, they'd probably love to have whatever the first big single was that did really well. They would love a version two of that, of course, but usually that's not going to happen, you yeah. know? And because um, the artist doesn't want to do that. They've already done that. Yeah. And and I'm I'm like, I'm with the artist. Like, let's, well, why don't we make a single that's really good, but that's something new and has all the strengths that the guy, you know, that the artist is known for. Yeah. And um, encompasses all of the other cool stuff that, er that everyone likes and that the artist likes to do. And I, and I feel like that's how you get the good stuff. But, but chasing something is, um, it's just never worked for me, you know, chasing, chasing the charts or chasing some trend in music that, that, um, is really popular now. The music that we're making now is going to come out maybe in six months and that is going to be done. That trend will be definitely done. Yeah. So, and then you're like a sitting duck, like no one's going to be interested in this thing. And, and, and frankly, I think the artist needs to, um, you know, stand in their own area away from other artists, not, not be a, a copycat or not, not, you know, not sound anything like other artists. Yeah. The, the, the big artists, the, for the most part, the, the artists that have, that, that I love, um, that are big to me, they're all very unique. They have a very unique presentation, all aspects from the sound, their look, the packaging, everything is, it's all very unique. And I think that that's where it's at. Trying to trace, ch trying to chase something that is already successful. Uh, it, it's, it's very difficult. I, I agree. I, I agree. I, I have a lot of experience doing uh, songwriting sessions for like years and years and years. And the times that everybody came in, like with the intention 
of writing something that sounded like something else. Like it was always, it was always an average day. And when people just came yeah. in and just like didn't have to write for an artist and they just pulled up a piano or whatever and just wrote, those were always the better songs and probably the ones that got cut. And those, that other stack of shit that was like trying to sound like whatever's hot right now, it just stays on the hard drive, you know? So yeah, I, I completely agree with you. Uh, okay, so before we, we hit our, our closing questions, I've got reports from, from an outside source of a remote-controlled airplane that may have been taking off of Sunset Sound, and I was told to mm. ask if you knew anything about this. Yeah, I may know of something about that, actually. <laughs> um, now, now, there's actually, are we talking Sunset Sound or Sound Factory? Uh, it could because be, could be there, either. There are both... Uh, the roofs of both of those studios have been used for um, <laughs> runway um, access. Um, yeah, we, uh, yeah. Yeah, okay, yes. all right, all right. Yeah. I do know, I mean, I, mean I, I know so many people that work with you. I know that, that you're really good at keeping the vibe in the room going and breaking it up. But then, like you said earlier, like you've got your targets. Like, how did, how how do you hit your targets and still make sure like everybody's having a great time? Um, it's a gift. You know what it is? No, I mean when when people are productive and you know when they're producing, I don't mean producing as a record producer, but producing a product, producing yeah. in the product of being a guitar take, coming up with a synth part. That would be a the product of that moment. You yeah. know, um, when when people are are making things, creating stuff. They feel good and 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 they kind of keep momentum going and, and morale is good. When it becomes a slog and you're just spending so much time in the minutia of like one little sound of whatever, um, going down a rabbit hole and not really having much movement with it, people get tired. Yeah. And the the and, and unmotivated. You know, so um, I think I think for me, what's worked for me is just keeping things moving and. Um, you know, just just having agility, moving fast, not getting bogged down on things. And um, and then you've got time to go fly airplanes off the roof of a studio, you know. <laughs> Perfect. That's awesome. Tony, this has been great. Uh, I've got two questions I ask everybody at the end. And, you know, we kind of touched on a little bit of this as we went, but has there ever been a time in your career that you chose to redefine what success meant for you? I mean, I'm always trying to, to, um, have songs and artists do well. And, and I think early on, like early, early on success for me was being able to work in a recording studio, like to make music in a recording studio. So if there were a day that I could actually go into a studio and work with an artist in a studio for one day, that was a huge success for me. Even if it was for like one hour. Yeah. You know? And then obviously that changed. So then, you know, when you do that enough, then you want to do a full album in a studio. And that was a big thing. And so, so yeah, it's, it's always... It's always it's it's evolved over the years. It's always evolving, but um, I think really you know the main thing for me is I like it when people hear music that I work on. So I, I, I like uh, it is success for me when the artist is doing well. It's success for me when randomly I'm out somewhere at a restaurant or whatever, and then it some a song comes on, or it's in a movie that I didn't know it was in, you know, and in, it's like in in a movie. Um, I like that. I like that. It it definitely feels good, and um, and again, it you know it means that the people like the artists. They like the music that we did, and and um, yeah, that that defines success. Yeah, I mean, I think that's huge. You know, like when when you're a kid, you listen to a record, and you know, a song will have such an impact. And I think for me, I I, I resonate with that a lot. Like that's that's one of the things that really gets me going is when something does well, and you're like. Some kid out here, out there is, you know, is being affected by this song the way that I was affected by that song 25 years ago or whatever. And 
I think that's huge. I think that's why so many people just keep doing this just to give people that thing that they had when they were a kid. Yeah, there was there was an artist that I worked with where um a fan had reached out to the artist. The album had just come out and the fan's little younger brother was I think deaf or hard of hearing and her brother had some kind of treatment done to his ears to where he was going to be able to hear. And the first music that he was going to hear was going to be a song off this album. And they told somehow this information got to the manager and then it got to, to the band. And, and I just thought, man, that is, um, a is like, is that the first thing that you want <laughs> to hear? Like maybe, <laughs> I don't know the Beatles or Prince. Or I don't know, but whatever. It's cool. But I thought, you know, it's just it's just really cool that obviously this music hit this girl in such a way to where she felt her brother needed to hear it, and and I thought that was really cool. And yeah, when people tattoo the lyrics or on their bodies, personally, I don't think that's a smart idea. But but whatever. But you know. But the point is somehow something about this song caused some emotion in that fan and it caused them to to react and, and to do that and to, you know where that song really became a part of their lives and, and i just i love that yeah yeah i think i think it's huge that's a good story i'm i'm glad i'm glad i didn't uh break into tears or anything now that this is a video show as well uh all right so the, the last question is uh what is your current biggest goal that you can share with people what's the next smallest step you're going to take to go towards that goal biggest goal um I've got a lot of really big goals and you know, and some of them, they're not necessarily music related, but with, I would say the biggest goal, you know, there's, there's certain artists that I would love to work with that, um, that would be a goal and I'm, and I'm trying, and the step is I'm trying to connect with those artists by any means necessary. So, you know, <laughs> either I, you know, through, through a connection I have or through my manager or, um, or some other way, you know, yeah. but it's cool. You know, I, I, I make lots of goals are a big thing for me. I mean, in, in just even in the, the day to day of, of making records, like I'm setting daily targets and goals. Um, it's just how I operate. It, it makes it easier for me to, to get through a day basically. Yeah. Uh, and to have something to show for that day. But, but so I'm, I'm always, I'm very goal oriented and, um, you know, I write them, I, I try to write them down mm. once or twice a day in the morning and at night. Um, I don't always have the time, but you know, I, I do try to, and then those goals, they're always changing as well. You know? Yeah. There's a, there's a lot to, to writing them down, visualizing them, telling them to, you know, your partner or your friend. It's something about like, just feel like more accountable to them when they're down on a piece of paper or, or whatever. Yeah. And it, it makes them more real. Yeah. Um, and I, I put them in the, in the present tense, like I am doing this. I have this, I, um, you know, you know, um, they're, they're present, not like I want to do this or I hope to do, you know, it's like, I am doing this. I have this. And I've done that for years. And it's funny because just randomly there'll be things that I write about, I kid you not. And then if, like, let's say if it's working with an artist, a few months later, this artist will reach out. It's the most, this has happened with so many things. And, and I don't know even, I don't even know how to explain it, but it's, it's, it, um, and it just happened recently with something with an artist who, who, I, who I just had lunch with the other day, but someone who I wanted to work with. And then they, they read an interview that I did in tape op magazine and then they reached out to me the most bizarre thing and i was just trying to think like how can i connect with this artist and and i was being a little slow at doing it and like oh, i don't know if, you know it's kind of going back and forth on doing it or not and then they reached out so it's just really bizarre yeah yeah i feel like uh you know a lot of people at least i believe that you kind of you kind of find what you're looking for you know it's like in, if you're looking for a positive experience do, walking into the studio, then you're going to have a positive experience if you're, you know, and I think that applies to what you're talking about. It's like, you're looking to work with these people. You're going to find in somehow find your way to that, to that space. And I guess right before we go, last question, 
it sounds like you're not afraid to reach out to somebody that you are passionate about that you want to work with. Can you speak to that and tell, you know, younger, younger kids like, Hey, reach out to people that you want to work with. I guess the fact that you're doing it should be an example enough that it's okay to reach out and say, Hey, I love your music. Is there any chance we can work together? Yeah. I mean, I I've done that for years, you know, that's amazing. Before, before, well, before social media and before the internet, but, um, <laughs> you know, many years ago, that's awesome. If there was, if there was someone that I wanted, that I'd liked and, you know, wanted to collaborate with, I would just try to hit them up. And often it's led to, to really cool things, you know, and it's some, sometimes it's not a, an immediate thing that happens. Yeah. There was one artist who, uh, this artist, Sandra Lurke, a Norwegian artist who, um, I heard his first album and, and just loved his album. And, and I reached out and through managers, you know, somehow I was able to connect and we connected and I said, man, I, I love your music. It's really cool. I'd love to work with you someday. If you ever are in LA or whatever, he was based in, in Norway at the time. And, um, I think two or three years later, we ended up doing a, a record together and, and we made a really cool album, but you know, it, it may not be an immediate thing, but, um, and it, it has to be the right communication as well. Cause you don't want to bother people, yeah. but you want to, you want to be enthusiastic and you want to be intentional with, with what you're wanting to do, but not waste people's time. So I'm also mindful of that. And, you know, yeah, it can't be about, you know, money. It's gotta be about, art you know and i think that's, well yeah it definitely can't be about the money yeah but, you know like i just think some this, people are like how am i going to get gigs i'm going to email everybody i know and that's not like reaching out to people that you don't actually want to work with just because you think they'll pay you is a horrible idea <laughs> you, this, this job um and it's hard to call it a job honestly because um it doesn't you know working on music doesn't feel like a job um there's other jobs working on a roof would be a job in the summer. Like that would be a very hard job. I would not be good at that. But um, if you're doing it for the money, it's gonna, I feel like it's harder. Yeah. It's harder for stuff to flow to you. Um, when I started off, yeah, I needed to get paid, um, but I wasn't doing it for the money. I was doing it because I wanted to work on music. And that that's, and that's still what I do. You know, I take projects all the time that are not necessarily, um, you know, there, there, some will be very low budget projects. Some, some, I, you know, I just love it so much. We'll, we'll, uh, you know, just gotta do it. Yeah. I gotta, I want to, I just want to work with the artist. So sometimes, um, you know, if you can really have it be about the music, I think things will flow to you. Yeah. They may, you know, you may not make a lot of money at first, but it will cause, the money to come. Yeah. You know, it'll cause the projects to come. But I think really it's building up an abundance of really good projects to show people and and to to get out there. And that that's basically what I did early on. I was just working on lots of stuff and work, you know, try to find cool stuff to work on. Not just anything, but um stuff that could hopefully get people's attention. Yeah. And I was doing a lot of it for no money. Literally um but you know one of those projects the um the drummer that were I worked that worked with uh me on that project, he ended up becoming the drummer for a French band called Air. And then he played the stuff that we did. I didn't get paid for it. They gave me literally pizza, like you know, lunch and dinner. Um and I was cool with it. I loved it. You know, we're we're working on cool music. I was I got to work on a Trident A range, which I had never, you know, used before. It was nice. great. Um, but he played it for Air, and then that caused me to work with Air. And then that caused me to, to work with a lot of British artists. And, you know, so I guess all I'm saying is just, you never know. And, um, it should definitely all be all about the, the creativity and, um, if, you know, and hopefully the money will come. <laughs> hopefully. Um, from the yeah. Yeah. Dude, that, that that's awesome. Please. Um, I guess share with people anything you want to share if there's a project that you're really passionate about if you have management that they can reach out to i don't know if there's anything you want to share this is a little spot for you yeah i mean pe people can hit me up however they 
people want to find me, you know, <laughs> Instagram, I have a website. They can find me there. They can reach out to me there. Um, you know. Awesome. Tony, this has been so much fun. I'm, I'm glad we got to connect. Like I said, we know so many, so many people, the same people, and I've listened to so much music you've made. So thanks for making all my music. Thank you so much. Yeah, appreciate it. Yeah, they loved it. That's it for this week's episode of Progressions. Thank you so much for watching or listening. Be sure to check out all the links and resources mentioned in the episode down below in the video description or in your podcast show notes. If you're listening to this as an audio podcast, please leave a review on Apple or Spotify. It helps the show so much. And if you're watching on YouTube, feel free to drop any thoughts or questions about the episode down below. Let's keep the conversation going. For those of you watching, you'll be getting a link to another episode you might enjoy popping up somewhere right about now. And for those of you listening, check out the YouTube. Hit that subscribe button if you haven't already, and I will see y'all next time.